actually in Austria, right? And, and this um, photo, this picture, was in the front page of Nature a couple of years ago, well, many years ago, 2005. Uh, and Venus, uh, it's, it's supposed to be a realistic portrait, right? With the realization of a female figure. And, and in this guide, uh, the corpulence that the image has suggests a higher social, social status, status, a symbol of security, success, and well-being. Um, and that's that's something that the society um, creates, right? Because when we have a newborn, like a very small child, a just born kid, uh, girl or, or boy, whatever, uh, used to say that, oh, he's so cute. Or in German, it's something like uh, Niedlich or something like that. Oh, yeah, sorry, guys, I have not tried to, to speak your language today. But you know what I mean. So it's cute, and when uh, it seems that if he's fat, it's cute. I don't know how it is here in German uh, or other place that you are from, but in Brazil it's like that. Like the, the the babies are expected to be a little bit fat because then they, they will be cute. Cute, and that's not. Uh, I'm not uh, complaining, right? So this, I I'm not saying for fathers and mothers that they are wrong saying that. But what I want to say is that something that it's part of, of your culture for years, where body fat, it's considered something like now you have the resources to eat, and then maybe this is why you're a little bit fat or overweight, and that can be a success, right? But society has changed a lot in the past years. I mean, I am 41 years old, and even in a short range of time, uh, considering the the, the, the the span of the human in the last century, let's say, uh, we I have seen so many changes in the way that we interpreted the things, right? So uh, here is the city where the um, the portrait was found, Willendorf or something like that, right? So yeah, it's it's, it's nice because the image was used to represent a, a special issue or some papers published at that uh, edition of Nature Neuroscience talking about obesity and the related metabolic disorders uh, that were rising worldwide at that time and still unhappily yeah, and how to effectively combat uh, this epidemic and the need to understand uh, not only the mechanisms that regulate energy intake expenditure, but also some of the modern aspects and neuromodern aspects of obesity. So, uh, and yeah, so when we talk about obesity, it's very common to start the talk showing some epidemiology statistics, right? So I put this uh, question sign here because I went through internet and I we never know internet what's true or not, but I tried to find some statistics from obesity in German population in general. So yeah, you probably uh, have much better information than me and can uh, further confirm or not these informations. But over the past years, the rate of population with obesity increased by 10% in Brazil. And it seems that in Germany, something around uh, 20%, right? Especially in older people, right? And also related to the fact that up to 60% of Brazilian population uh, have a sedentary lifestyle. It seems that half of the population in Europe has this um, style, lifestyle. I didn't find information specifically for German, but I saw that in German, the sedentary lifestyle, let's say, has started, uh, has started, sorry, has increased by 7% over the past decade. So it's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot of people that are changing in a bad way the lifestyle, right? And, and where is that all that information and all that memes that I saw on the internet that the German like to walk, they don't want to go by car, they want to cycle. So even 
even if your society has this very strong characteristic that for the foreign games, it's what we saw, there is still some questions there regarding sedentary lifestyles. And, and it has many bad impacts because, of course, a sedentary lifestyle you have in, uh, impact on body composition, locomotion, but also others that maybe are not so visible. I mean, if someone can walk fast, we can clearly uh, observe that. But sometimes some cognitive and, and perception adaptations, they, they are not um, easily observed, right? And one is starting point that when we discuss about obesity is that people sometimes don't realize they are overweight. So people don't realize that they uh, may need to change lifestyle. It is the case for this paper. It was published a couple of years ago, but uh, I, I believe that results still around the, the same, uh, the same, this around, uh, it's still similar. The results still similar after a couple of years. So look at this. Adolescents with expected weight and who identify as having expected weight. So 70% overestimate their weight. And most of them can identify they have the expected weight, right? So when we ask adolescents with overweight, we saw that half of them or more than half of them uh, can identify they have overweight. And 40 almost 40% say that they have the expected or lighter weight. So there's a lot of adolescents that cannot identify themselves as having overweight. And it seems that these statistics have, have not changed from 20, um, 2005 to 2012. So almost half of adolescents with overweight do not identify themselves as such. And, and that, that's a problem. Well, I would not say that's a problem, but it's something that shows us that we need to do something. Like this is these adolescents, they are in the school period, right? So school age, they are studying. So maybe we have to include these topics in our lectures. So the adolescents will be exposed to the topic and they can start to think about it, right? But today we're not talking about not only not to talk only about adolescents, we will talk to discuss two questions, right? Uh, the questions are which neuromotor adaptations are observed in obesity? And in the end, I will ask if our exercise plans for obese people uh, are influenced by these adaptations. Yeah, let's see. So let's start about uh, talking about cognition, right? It's know for a while that overweight and obesity, but not the body mass index. It is, this is a key message of this lecture that sometimes body mass index is not associated with changes that are attributed to obesity, but the fat percentage, right? So we are talking more about this later. So be, uh, overweight and obesity cause atrophy in the white matter with maximum effect in midlife that correspond to a increase of about 10 years in brain age. This is neurodegeneration, right? So neurodegeneration. So the first message is that overweight and obesity can cause neurodegeneration. And we could move very quickly to the <clears throat> movement aspect. Because if the brain is not working well, <clears throat> maybe many, many other systems will not uh, work well uh, too. But before talking about the modern aspects, let's go a little bit deeper on the cognition and see how important it is to consider obesity and its effects when we are working uh, with children and adolescents. Because the obesity in childhood, ch childhood obesity is negatively associated 
with the working memory and learning deficits, right? So it means that there is a worse school performance in, in children and in adolescents with uh, obesity. And the association that the studies discuss is because they uh, consume more sugar, it decreases the amount of uh, BDNF, that's a protein very important in our body, including for, for learning and memory. There is a reduced uh, sense of satiety, so they want to eat more food. And well, if you increase your intake of energy and you do not increase your um, expenditure, you know what happens, right? Uh, these cognitive uh, deficits are associated, for example, with decision making and memory capacity. Decision making, in, well, in the, in the, for the teenagers, decision making in, is by, by itself a challenge, right? Most of the adolescents, when they have to take a decision, they are always, mm, I don't know, maybe yes, well, 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 let's see what happens. So it's very hard to take a decision, right? And if they are have this condition, they, they have this, these conditions of overweight and obesity, uh, such behavior can be even worse. And of course, memory capacity in adolescents being impaired is also a problem, because not only for the classes, but uh, for whole life, for daily life. I mean, we need memory every day, every single moment. We are, we need memory right now be, to remember what I have been talking about two, two slides ago. Of course, this lecture is recorded. You can stop and go back, but that's not what I talk about, right? And the, the, there is also evidence suggesting that the functional activity of the brain is reduced in those regions associated with uh, episodic memory, for example. And it has an impact in long-term memory. And this is why uh, we talk a lot about obesity being associated with the onset or it means the, the, the start the trigger for some neurodegenerative uh, disease right um, so far until now in this uh, part of the lecture we can summarize that there are correlations between obesity and development of maybe onset could be easier here of Alzheimer's disease. There is also a correlation between obesity and development of Parkinson's disease. Uh, and obesity may aggravate diseases that are already present, right? Uh, and that's clear that metabolic changes due to overweight are related to damage in the central nervous system. So what to do? Ah, exercise. Yeah, right. Many of you, I think, uh, are pursuing a degree uh, in exercise-related fields or have a degree in exercise fields. And we know that exercise is important. And then we are trying now to, in the second part of the lecture now, to connect these changes in the brain um, aspects and movement production. And let's see this very interesting paper showing that in obese children, motor con conduction velocity is lower than in the control. So when you talk about the frequency of transmission of information from the brain to the periphery, there is a change in the frequency for obese, right? And this uh, sensory uh, conduction velocity is lower than the control group has many impacts, not only for movement generation, but also for movement control. Yeah? And one um, quite simple aspect, it's also easy to implement assessment in obese people in the field. I mean, not in the lab, but in schools, clinics, um, social centers, church, whatever, right? is to observe the effects of the overweight obesity on postural control. Uh, you know that the, the ability that we have to upright stand, to keep upright standing, it's one of the top most studied in biomechanics. And that's, that's, that's reasonable because it's one of the more important activities that we do in the whole life to stay 
uh, upright standing. So when we evaluate the ability to keep this posture in obese people, we found that deficits in postural control are more correlated with body fat percentage than body mass index. And that was talking before about the importance of not looking only to the body mass index, and I know that you realize why, but also to the body fat measurements, right? Uh, if we start to move our body, then we need to be able as well to, to deal with, with some um, challenges of the movement. One of them represented here is very common this uh, time of year here in German. Uh, that is uh, the reactive responses. So it seems that uh, <clears throat> obesity increases the sleep in speed and the rate of falls. It means that uh, the, when you sleep, right? If if a person is sleep, not you. If a person is sleep, not sleep, sleep, right? Sleep, uh, and it is a obese person. This the, the, they will have thirty percent more uh, chance uh, of uh, a fall. Yeah, I mean, kind of confusing here, guys. Sorry. Uh, when we evaluate sleep responses and obese and non-obese people, 30% of the bees fell after the sleep and controls without uh, overweight only 10%. So we have three more chances to sleep uh, three times uh, if you are obese. So yeah, there's uh, some many, many aspects here. For example, if you are working with a group of people that are obese, you know they have a higher chance of fall if they sleep. So the floor of the place you are conducting your activity is something to take care of, right? Of course, it's something important for everyone. You don't want your students or your, your patients or your clients to fall down, you know? Of course not. We're not I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you have your group of patients, students, clients, wherever they are, obese people, those obese will have more chance to fail, right? And there are some interesting protocols that you can use to evaluate this. Uh, in this video here, um, this study <coughs> uses the CMU treadmill that's available someplace. This was in KU Leuven in Belgium uh, during my postdoc uh, internship. And, but I know that even here in the Chemnitz uh, Technische Universität, we have this uh, similar device that you can um, project images in the ground and, and, and quantify reactive and compensatory responses. And we know that stumble and slips will require a higher level of neuromuscular control. And remember that before I mentioned one paper showing that in obese people, uh, they have they have uh, impaired um, capacity of transmit trans, of transmission of sensorial information through the axons. So this is why neuromuscular control. Well, this is one of the reasons why neuromuscular control it's impaired and they make their responses are uh, delayed. And when you when your response is delayed, sometimes well, you just have problem to to finish the movement. Uh, of course, that for, until now we are talk about how brain and movement control are interrelated and how obesity has an impact on these uh, mechanisms. But of course, you are probably looking for some biomechanics outcomes as well in this population, yeah, it's true because they are there, it's true. Um, of course, if you increase mass of a uh, body, there will be more force involved, right, for the same acceleration amount. And what we found in obesity people is that obesity causes adaptations to the load during locomotion, yeah? And this occurs with a gradual increase in body mass. So there is a relationship between increases in body mass 
and mechanical response, especially for the lower extremity. And obese people, they need to generate more torque and joint power to produce the same movement of a non-obese person. So let's say, for example, it's not specifically the case here on this paper, but if you compare two, 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 two individuals walking at five kilometers per hour in a treadmill and you are measuring uh, kinematics and kinetics to calculate the joint moments and power, there will be a higher demand for joint moments and power in the obesity, right? But this is quite obvious, right? This is quite obvious. This is why we need to, to, to expand a little bit our discussions, because if someone needs to produce more power, but they don't have the necessary strength, it can lead to early fatigue, right? And again, let's think about the comparison between someone expected weight and someone overweight uh, walking at a certain speed, right? And we can calculate the metabolic cost. Probably the metabolic cost will be higher for those obese uh, uh, people. And if we consider there's a relationship between the energy expenditure and fatigue mechanism installation or whatever, um, there will be early fatigue in this, this uh, group, right? It, it can result in a poor uh, model performance. I also talk about biomechanics. Uh, we need to consider that um, the impact forces during uh, locomotion in the obese people will be always be will be also affected, right? So it seems that obese individuals they have difficult when they are dealing with impact forces and they show a higher rate of force application which it means that when you hit the ground the speed in which the grand reaction force increase is faster in obese than in non-obese and we also found studies like this one showing that these obese individuals have lower knee flexion in the stance phase. And I'm not going through very deep on this today, but you know that the knee flexion during the stance phase um, is associated with the leg stiffness and has an impact not only to absorb uh, forces, but also in the propulsion. Uh, it is bad if you don't, do not bend your knee when you have this stance phase, but it's also bad if you bend your knee too, too much. That's the case for uh, obese. And just, just uh, I still talk about the, the, the previous one. If you flex your knee um, um, in an excessive way, let's say, you probably can also increase your energy cost because the oscillation of the center of mass in the vertical direction will be higher and it has a direct e effect on um, movement economy. So <clears throat> these changes happen for different ages, not only for adults, not only for elderly, but also for the children. And that's uh, important to consider because if the, the children has obesity, there will be adaptations in the very early stage of the life, right? And this, the, if you go back to the first slides, uh, I showed something for you related to the neurodegeneration that is associated with the obesity, right? And in, yes, it can also be a, a problem for the young age, right? But here, back to the biomechanics um, part of the discussions, uh, we also saw that uh, children has uh, uh, changed the knee flash and initial contact. There is a higher pelvic drop and also an overload of plantar flexor muscles. It suggests some um, impacts uh, related to a poor impact absorption in children. Maybe impact is not a problem for children. Some of you will say that, well, they need impact, right? because the, they need to have the bones stronger. That's true, right? But we remember that we are not talking about no having no impact here. Uh, we, are also, we are always 
talking about what happens to the obese in comparison to a match control that's known obese, right? And the fitness and fatigue, it's also they are also present in children as in the adults and older, as I mentioned before, right? So higher joint overload, not just to excesses to ex to excessive uh, weight, uh, but related to the increased joint overload, uh, especially the knee joint under fatigue. So what I want to say here is that there is an effect of fatigue and joint moments and joint load, let's say, uh, in children, but the effect can be worse in obese children. And all this discussion that I am conducting our talk here, and we are now going to the third part and the last, um, many, many times involve the word impact, right? So impact. I'm not saying that impact is bad, right? We can have this discussion another time, but we have to consider that impact can have some bad outcomes for the lower extremity of the whole body, right? And some of these impacts, uh, this impact force can have an effect in the foot biomechanics or foot neuromechanics. And one interesting thing is that in among obese children, uh, it is often observed um, um, a higher relate, uh, report of pain in the foot, right? So reports of foot pain are more common among uh, overweight or obese children. And, and this pain is considered a factor uh, to explain why sometimes they avoid exercising, right? And if you don't do exercise, you have um, um, adaptation that is bad, right? Because you're not using your body. So you're not using your body, you give a message to the body that the body doesn't need to be strong, you don't need much muscle mass, you don't need to have strong bones, and that's that's bad, right? And it seems that uh, food can be a, a good model to understand how these adaptations are observed in children. So uh, the foot pain and foot-related functional limitations observed in obese uh, people uh, are associated with some changes in foot mechanics. Uh, it includes the dorsal flexion strength, uh, the strength of the allux and the fifth metatarsal, step length, stride length, and walking speed. And some maybe you are wondering, so wow, dorsal flexion strength, but why is this important? Dorsal flexion, it's a very important movement for walking to avoid tripping, trip, right? So when you go walk up stairs, on your walk a stair to get in the bus or the train, whatever, the car, or even doing exercise, uh, trip, tripping, it's a higher, uh, how can I say, um, the, the, the rate of falls after a trip is very high. So this is why one of the, the reasons that dorsal flexion strength is important. Allux and fifth metatarsal strength are very important because they are an important component of foot stiffness for foot uh, progression uh, in, during walking and running, right? And of course, step length and stri stride length are important components for walking speed. So the, when, when, when this, uh, people have foot pain, they have a bad impact in quality of life, right? And sometimes, maybe some of you are thinking that, well, but sometimes I have foot pain as well. Yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that people that are non-obese have foot pain. But I, what I'm saying that these relations are stronger in obese than in non-obese uh, participants. 
you have to note that most of the papers that I am showing here uh, in this lecture, they include uh, groups of obese, overweight and non-overweight uh, participants, or at least obese and non-overweight. So there is always a control to compare. That's very important to take um, to take conclusions like that. So we can say that sometimes some things here you already know. Yeah? I'm pretty sure that a sedentary lifestyle is associated with a higher chance of developing obesity. Right? Uh, obesity leads to a low level of physical activity. Right? Do it many reasons that we already mentioned, but it also decreases the tolerance of soft tissues to mechanical load, increase food problems and pain. By food problems, let consider um, like um, food kinematics, food mobility, whatever. Mobility in general and muscle atrophy. Mobility decreases and muscle atrophy atrophy increases among obese people. Uh, in the very last part of the lecture, I want to show you something that we are researching back in Brazil. Uh, there are other groups working in this topic in Brazil. And as I said in the start of the talk, it's a hot topic, which means that many places in the, in the world are doing research on obesity, right? Um, a couple of years ago, we went to a school to evaluate kids, right? So we evaluated the tacti tactile sensitivity in the foot and also the plantar pressure in obese and non-obese children. And what we found... Oh, sorry, I passed the slide. Sorry. But what we found in that uh, study was that foot pressure and foot sensitivity were changed in obese children uh, and the changes were related to lower uh, capacity of the discrimination of touch in the foot which means bad sensitivity and also a higher rate of plantar pressure distribution suggesting a flat foot and by children, children, I'm talking about scholars with the age between 9 and 12 years old. So too young to have this kind of alterations, right? And food sensitivity and postural control, plantar pressure are very important uh, in the daily life. And there are some interesting relationships suggesting that there are specific regions of the food that contribute more to postural control. And when we you have a I thought that it's very difficult to say that ah because your halux has a higher sensitivity, your con postural control is better. That's very difficult to 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 to, to do this um, direct relationship. But what we know is that in general lower sensitivity is associated with a bad postural control. Um, it happens not only for the elderly, that is the case in this paper that I'm showing the screen, but also for children as we showed in the previous one. Right? So uh, this lower sensitivity, sorry, the plantar sensitivity is lower in all regions of the foot in uh, obese children. What is the effect of this? So, so far, neurodegeneration, some negative adaptations for cognitive performance, uh, changes in joint overload, changes in food proprioception, not, well, not food proprioception, but uh, food sensitivity to touch, for example, plantar pressure, all this information taken together influence a cycle that we have for movement control because we need feedback 
not only to produce movement but to control movement uh, in this sense when your, your, your body move we are able to detect these movements right and this detection relies on the sensory feedback that is sent to the central nervous system of course some of this information doesn't need to go to the brain for example some information goes to the cerebellum another ones even reach only the 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 spinal cord I, that's not the idea to discuss these different levels of motor control today but to illustrate that sensor information will be important to be received by the components of central nervous system and and also these uh, pathways for the execution of the movement the efferent uh, ways will also be important and we learn from these papers published in the past that both these pathways afferent, afferent and afferent uh, pathways the sensorial pathway and the uh, movement pathway they are changed in a negative way due to obesity so it's complicated to propose a solution for that uh, of course that our body can adapt so if someone go through a specific training or a clinical treatment treatment to reduce overweight some of this change and they are reversible right our brain is very smart and 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 can quickly do some uh, neuroplasticity but sometimes people will live the whole you live the lifespan with the obese condition right so in this sense one thing that maybe it's important to consider is to propose some interventions that can improve quality of life and these uh, people helping them to to be more physical active and helping them to to do physical exercise to do their daily life routine in a safer way why i'm talking about safer way what, what i mean by safer way remember that we mentioned that foot pain it's higher in obese people and also foot movement control in general can be impaired so what i want to say by a safer way to do exercise is to have a proper model control of the foot for example that will be very important for walking for running for cycling for weight lifting for walking for any activity basically that uh, the, these people will uh, join as a regular training we have been working on this in the past years um, especially after we start this collaboration with Dr. Germano here in Chemnitz and I'm in the final part now it's the final part guys really the, the, of the lecture I want to show you some outcomes of our most recent uh, research so what we're trying to do is to manipulate the food sensitivity and see if when we improve food sensitivity we can get better results for postural control and foot control in general and we found some very promising results published in this paper which is available in the food journal so we found that by warming the foot using infrared light uh, we can increase uh, tactile sensitivity and the, the intervention is uh, easy to, to implement right and when you look at the postural control outcomes that remember I mentioned that's a very nice model to study motor control the quiet standing the quiet upright standing we found that uh, when the foot warming increased foot sensitivity this uh, improved uh, sensitivity could be associated with better postural control for the majority of the adults that were evaluated uh, here I'm not going through the graphs because you can check the paper 
but these are the individual responses and if you go through the, the variables here uh, you can clearly see that for most of the people the direction will be like a decrease so if the amplitude the speed area decrease it means that uh, the postural control um, maybe it was better in that task right of course these uh, studies here are not addressing the obese uh, people yet but we did a similar experiment with the elderly because many of the changes observed in the obese are similar to the adaptations observed in, in elderly in the older uh, people right because they also you have difficult support model control delayed reactive responses uh, weaker uh, muscles early fatigue impaired postural control and we found that this intervention here aiming to uh, increase food temperature and by increasing food temperature stimulate the mechanical receptors improves food sensitivity in the elderly in the older adults as well and it has a different effect in body sway uh, the effect in body sway was not as clear as it was in the adults that was a little bit an expected result for us because i would expect the opposite like for the adults the postural control is not a big challenge so they would be able to to manage the, the task quite easily but in the older people on another on other hand they would be benefit more uh, by the increase in food sensitivity that was the case for some of the participants, but not for all the participants. And, and then we realized a confusing factor in the participants that was the overweight. Because some of the, adult, the older adults here, they were a bit uh, above the expected weight for the age. And then we are now uh, <clears throat> moving on in this research to investigate if this kind of intervention to improve to increase food sensitivity um, can also be a potential strategy to manipulate um, neuromotor um, control in, uh, in obese right and why we do all of this research and how we why we read all these papers every day to find a better uh, strategies to keep the elderly active, right? So I really like this video here. Um, uh, this guy was one of my master lever was one of my my former master students back in Brazil, and these two ladies here, uh, they were part of um, elderly older group uh, older people group that we followed through one year. Uh, providing them with physical exercise and many many activities to stimulate uh, movement and motor control and in this day the manager of the place like this is a social service in the city right so the coordinator of the place when she saw the the, the lady uh, jumping the here she came and said, no, please, if they, if they, they fall, if they have an, uh, an accident or something like that, there will be a big problem for us. And we said, no, no, don't be worried because they are being trained for that. So they are over than 70 years old and they, are very, they were very active at that time. Uh, and the, the reason to be very active and, and, and do this thing is because they are physically active. And that's, it's clear that all these neuromotor adaptations that we mentioned, I, I tried to summarize in this lecture, right? And more than give you information, um, maybe giving some directions for those of you that want to learn more about obesity effects on motor control and back to the two questions in the opening of the lecture which neuromotor adaptations are observed in obesity in and are our exercise plan for obese people influenced by this adaptation
adaptations. So yeah, there are many motor, mo neuromotor adaptations. We saw that there is neuroplasticity in a bad way. Uh, there are changes in memory and learning. Uh, there are also impairments in decision make. There is a role of overweight and fat percentage on the development of neurodegenerative diseases. There is also impairment in nerve conduction. There are impairments in reactive response for postural tasks and also for walking. There are increase in joint loads. In, there is higher impact and then uh, a claim for a better impact absorption strategies. There are very important changes in foot biomechanics, could say also foot neuromechanics, because there are some changes in muscle activity that I, I did not include in this discussion today. There are changes in foot perception. And remember that one main issue in the obese is foot pain and foot perception, uh, it's involved in foot pain as well. And there is a general reducement uh, in the mobility. So are our exercise plans influenced by these adaptations? Yes, definitely, right? So how? Yeah. So are, are we actually considering all these adaptations when we do our exercise planning? For example, are we including dual task um, conditions in the exercise sessions for these participants? Because dual task increase the cognitive load and it can be a good way to train our cognition and to improve our cognition, right? Are we evaluating risk factors and also trying to do some monitoring of the neurodegenerative disease characteristics in the people that we are working with? Are we clear about how reactive response joint loads and impact are affected by the um, overweight? And, and also, are we clear that the solution is not to avoid impact in this participant, but manage the way the impact is uh, exposed, uh, managing the way they are exposed to impact, maybe considering different floor surfaces, uh, amount of exercise, a kind of exercise. Right? Are we considering that they maybe have pain in the foot or maybe they have a weak foot and ankle? And are we evaluating this? Are we asking the participants, our clients, our patients, our, uh, the people that we are working with about how they feel if they are pain or if they are feeling something different in the, the foot, that's very easy to implement, but sometimes I think that people just don't consider. And are we aware about the impairments in mobility that includes also walking and some of the adaptations that elderly will show, the, the elderly, sorry, elderly will show as well, but in this case, obese people will show. I don't know, guys. I don't know if all, we are all considering this because sometimes I think that we consider an exercise plan as something that can be applied for everyone. And, and but that's not true, right? Uh, it, uh, in Brazil, it's very common to the obese and to the elderly go to the physician, and the physician says that they need to walk. Now you need to do exercise. So you need to walk. Let's go and walk. Walk. Walking. Walking exercise. But now, 
try to realize all that can happen if you just do walking exercise and if you have all these adaptations reactive response cognition dual task impact foot perception pain mobility that's not enough what i want to say that's not enough to to, to recommend an, uh, an obese people just to increase walking that this is much more complex to plan the exercise for um, obese participant but i hope this talk uh, was able to increase your curiosity about the topic and maybe provide you with some important reference that you can go through the papers and and learn a bit more and I, I try to separate some final remarks here about the topic and here they are so obese people show impaired neuromotor performance obesity can accelerate neurodegeneration there are important adaptations in the central nervous system that helps to explain the motor deficits observed in the obese fat percentage is associated with these adaptations body mass index not always or not as strong as fat percentage gait it's altered suggesting a higher mechanical load and it helps to explain early fatigue foot neuromechanics it's an important matter and interventions can help but obesity grows so fast so we need to well to avoid all these problems what you need to do is to increase the level of physical activity in the population and that's a big challenge and not the topic of this talk here but something that we can keep reverberating in our uh, minds for the future by finishing this lecture i want to thank you and invite you to scan this qr code here and then you have access to a folder a dropbox folder that has all the papers that i mentioned in this lecture right so thank you guys and hope to see you around another opportunity